and thank you to the library uh, for inviting me. My name is Evan Weiner, and I'm in radio and TV, and this is the first time I'm up in your area since 2006, when Larry Strickler over at Cutcher's invited me for a second year uh, to talk to uh, people at Cutcher's. And uh, I got to listen to Speedy Garfin as well over at the side lounge. And uh, you know, he told me how much he loved playing the side lounge at Cutcher's. Uh, I have been in um, the business, radio and TV, since I'm 15 years old. Started in Rockland County uh, at Mount Ivy, New York, WRKL. We did a show at Spring Valley High School called Tiger Talk. Terrible show, worst show in the world, but opened the door for me uh, for a career. And I got to thank Joe Dionisio, who was uh, my English teacher. He said, you got a good voice, student. Uh, how would you like to be on radio? And that's how it started. He also got me at the Nyack Journal News and the Bergen Record. And I still talk to Joe 49 years later. Uh, he lives down in Orange County and uh, he still calls me student. Uh, baseball in the American culture. Um, it's been in the American culture forever, so it seems. In fact, in 1865, uh, the new president of the United States, Andrew Johnson, was trying to figure out how to mend the country after the Civil War. And it was suggested to him, he was a baseball fan, why don't you invite members of the Brooklyn Atlantics and the Washington team to the White House uh, for lunch? Because a lot of people like baseball and maybe that would help start healing the country. So even in 1865, baseball was... Uh, being played, it was a different form of baseball than you see today, but uh, there were outside forces that were trying to uh, make baseball even more popular, and going to the White House was a big deal. Uh, Yogi, of course, I used to speak at his museum um, in Little Falls, uh, New Jersey, at Montclair State University, uh, and Yogi came to every one of my talks, um, believe it or not, he used to hang around the museum, and he I think enjoyed the talks because he used to come up to me afterwards. He'd pat me on the back, said, good job, kid. Let's go eat. And Yogi would sit down and we'd have lunch and there were no yogiisms. And he looked at me one day, he says, you want a yogiism? I said, sure. He says, I can't think of one. That's <laughs> the end of that. But Yogi was a big part of the so-called golden age of baseball, which was the 1950s. Uh, I'm not sure how golden the age really was. It was golden in the New York City area because the Yankees, they were in the World Series uh, throughout the 1950s, except in 54 and 59. In 54, the New York Giants beat the Cleveland Indians to win the championship that year. And even 1959, it was the Los Angeles Dodgers that won the World Series. And most of their players had been in Brooklyn uh, two years prior when O'Malley uh, moved them in 1957 to LA in 1958, there were still a number of the, those Dodgers from Brooklyn on that team. So I take it back to 1954, and there was a French philosopher by the name of Jacques Barzan. And he was writing a series of essays, which would become a book eventually. And he was waxing poetic about baseball. And baseball is a big literature sport as well. Uh, Barzan know that Whoever wants to know the heart and mind of America had better learn baseball. And in fact, he had a suggestion. Uh, he said, don't go to major league games. Go to the sandlots, watch kids play, or go to the high school, watch the high school kids play, or go to a minor league game, or go to an industrial league game, uh, because that is where you learn what American values are. Unfortunately, toward the end of his life, about... Um, 50 years later or so, Barzan was turned off by baseball because he said it became too commercial. He loved baseball in the 1940s and the 1950s. Um, that's Casey at the bat. And Casey at the bat, uh, that was a problem for me when I was in fourth grade in Miss Alexander's class. I'll talk to you about that in a second. Uh, Casey at the bat was written by a guy by the name of Ernest Thayer. He was a columnist with the San Francisco Examiner in the 19th century. I did some work for the San Francisco Examiner in the year 2001. So you could say uh, Thayer was part of uh, two centuries before me. Uh, in 1886 and 1888 with the San Francisco Examiner, I was there in 2001. Um, he wrote the poem, 
Casey at the Bat. It was printed on June 3rd, 1888. But he didn't take author's credit. Now, nobody seems to know why he didn't take author's credit. Maybe he didn't think that much of it. In fact, there's not too much about Casey uh, other than Thayer wrote it. Uh, sometimes when you're a writer, and I've written over 4,000 radio scripts, and uh, I've written about 700 newspaper pieces, you just turn out, you crank out stuff, and, you know, it, somebody may think it's good, and you think, you know, it's just a throwaway. So maybe, just maybe, Thayer thought it was a throwaway. Thayer would read the poem at a Harvard class reunion, oh, seven years after the poem came out. But by the time he read the poem in 1895, it had become part of Americana. Now, um, we don't know much about Casey. We, in fact, we don't know anything about Casey. Uh, was he Mike King Kong Kelly, who played in New England back in the day because they grew up around New England? Was it somebody from Stockton, California? The minor league team there is called the Mudville Nine. And um, there are people back from those days, obviously, not today, who think that it was a player on the Stockton team. Um, when I was at uh, PS 151 in Queens in 1964-65, uh, this would be the 65 portion of the year, uh, I was in fourth grade and I had a teacher by the name of Miss Alexander. Now, Miss Alexander, uh, oh, she was old. We thought she was about 170 years old but she was probably about 65 years old. She had the blue hair. Blue hair seemed to be a big deal for older people back, uh, people my age now, back in 1965. She had a white blouse on. She had the, the tissue stuck up here. She always wore a blue skirt. She was prim and proper at all times. So she tells us we have to analyze. We have to analyze Casey at the bed. Now, I'm eight going on nine years old. I'm a year ahead. Everybody else is nine going on 10 or 10 at that point. And we have to analyze the poem. And yeah, I'm reading the poem. And I did at that point collect these things, baseball cards. And I'm thinking, this is a lousy player. Struck out with the bases low. Mudville has a chance to win. There's no joy in Mudville today. But the mighty Casey has struck out. So I just thought he was a lousy baseball player. I found out lousy is not really an English word also. But uh, Miss Ellison says, no, 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 no. This is not what it's about. You've analyzed it wrong. This is not what it's about. Not what it's about. I said, well, what's it about? And then she proceeded to tell the class, it's about man's failures. That man could strive to do the best that he could do. But the mighty case he struck out. To me, to this day, he's still a lousy player. Reminds me a lot of Rod Swoboda. I saw a game in 1969, Mets against Cardinals, doubleheader in June, and Rod Swoboda struck out five times in one game, which I told him about later on. He says, is that your memory of me? I said, yeah, you're striking out five times, which he did in the game. So Thayer would read the poem at a Harvard class reunion in 1895, and it was famous. It was famous because of this guy, DeWolf Hopper. Now, Hopper's daughter, you might know, if you're my age, you would certainly know her because Hedda Hopper was a gossip columnist and appeared on talk shows like Merv Griffin and Mike Douglas in the 1960s. Um, that's her father, DeWolf Hopper. And somehow he got his hands on the San Francisco Examiner poem. Nobody seems to know how, certainly no internet in those days. And San Francisco was a a small cutoff city back in those days, uh, even though it wasn't far from Souther's uh, farm where, where gold was discovered or Virginia City. Uh, but it was still, you know, the way you traveled in those days, it was still kind of using a Borscht Belt term, a schlep. Anyway, so he gets this poem and he decides, I like this poem and I can do something with it. He's an actor. So all of a sudden he comes up with Casey at the back. He is going to act it out in a one-man play. So he becomes a vaudeville act featuring Casey at the Bat. And the first time he does that is August 14, 1888. It's estimated that uh, Hopper performed the poem more than 10,000 times in his career. Stage, uh, record, and silent film. And he did that through the 1920s. But it wasn't Hopper that you would get in your house if you had one of these things 
in your house. This is the Springfield, New Jersey library. And uh, that played music you know, or whatever it played in the 1890s. Uh, Springfield, uh, New Jersey library has custody of that because uh, there was a hermit who lived in town who had no heirs. And um, he had a lot of stuff in his house, including that thing that played cylinders. Um, and uh, that thing still works. Uh, the uh, woman who uh, is the librarian at the Springfield Library uh, took me aside. And that's the room that you speak in there. It's a museum room, Springfield Museum Room, and a lecture center. And she took me aside. Uh, she put the key in there, opened it up, and that thing still plays. Uh, I was playing a Sousa march at the time. But in 1893, if you were a baseball fan, well, this guy could take care of you. His name is Russell Hunting. He was an actor and he was a vocal, vocalist and he played with sound recordings and made sound recordings back then. So in 1893, he records with a heavy Irish brogue. After all, presumably Casey is Irish, even though we don't know his last name. Um, Casey, um, because Casey, uh, is recorded in 1893 and again in 1898. And Russell Hunting is the first to actually record the poem. Hopper is out there playing it. And at this time also, baseball players were on the vaudeville st stage uh, as well. They didn't make much money and they were kind of entertainers. So some of them got on stage. In 1905, John Kaiser recorded it for uh, Thomas Edison down in Menlo Park, New Jersey. Uh, Hopper's version was recorded for Victor before it became RCA Victor, Nipper the Dog, his master's voice. Uh, Hopper's version would come out in 1906. And chances are, if you got uh, the Kaiser recording or you got the Hopper recording, it played on that. So I was in Sagaway, Quebec last year. I speak on cruise ships. And I'm just walking through Sagway, and uh, this guy has his garage open, and there are people inside, and I said, wow, look at that, and it works. Uh, so if you were in the home, you got one of those, you could listen to Casey at the Bat. Casey would be on film by 1922. Hopper would be the first to commit the verse to film. A short subject by Lee DeForest. Wallace Beery starred in the 1927 version of the film. Bob Hope's second banana, Jerry Colonna, uh, recorded a rendition for Disney. And uh, that would be the basis for a 1946 Disney cartoon, Casey at the Bat. Jackie Gleason performed it on his TV show in the 1950s. Johnny Bench and Tug McGraw voiced the poem in orchestral settings, along with George M. Steinbrenner III and Billy Martin. I'm not sure which Billy that was, Billy one, two, three, four, or five managing the Yankees, but they were in Tampa. And George and Billy did the poem with an orchestra uh, for the benefit of the Tampa Police Benevolent Association. So Casey at the Bat is uh, now 132 years old, uh, but some schools still require kids. Uh, in New Jersey, I found this out, not too many, uh, to read Casey at the Bat. Again, getting back to Miss Alexander, what's it about? That's what the kids are supposed to find out. And hopefully most of them will agree with me that he was a lousy player and not that, um, you know, the mighty Casey struck out and ruined dreams or things like that. Now, if you were on the New York City subway back in 1907, 1908, chances are you probably saw that sign next to Jonathan Zinmore, the Zitz fixer. Um, he had signs all over the place. There was a songwriter by the name of Jack Norworth, who had just broken up with a woman who was a suffragette. Um, and he's looking at this, and apparently this woman liked baseball, who he'd broken up with. And he's looking at this, and he's looking at this, and he's looking at that, and says, there may be a song in this thing. So he goes to see his partner, Alvin von, Albert von Tilzer. Neither one of them had ever seen a baseball game. And he discusses the idea, and he's discussing the idea, and von Tilzer writes the words, Norwood writes the music to Harry Carey's favorite song, Take Me Out to the Ball Game. Now, Harry Carey made it popular again 
in Batman camp style, because she had to sing it rather badly. I worked with Harry in 1994-95. You had to sing it rather badly. What you don't see there is Harry with his six best friends named Bud, last name Wiser. He used the sponsor's product. Anyway, in between the top of the seventh inning and the bottom of the seventh inning at Wrigley Field in non-COVID days, uh, back in the 1980s, carried on to this day, Harry's long gone. Somebody sings, take me out to the ball game. The catch is, you got to sing it badly. And they get celebrities to sing it, and you have to sing it badly. Or it doesn't work. It was written in 1908. It was made popular on the vaudeville stage. Now, let's talk a little bit about Katie Casey, who is really the star of the song. There are three stanzas to the song. Uh, the prelude, well, she has the baseball bug bad and she is with a boyfriend, a husband, maybe a friend, some male person, and they are trying to figure out what they're going to do today. Well, they go back and forth and Katie says, I wanna to go to a baseball game. The guy, no, no, no. She says, I want to go to a baseball game. Guys, now let's do something. Says, they're going back and forth in the first stanza. Finally, she can't deal with this anymore. She cannot deal with this guy saying, no, no, no. Instead, she says, take me out to the ball game. Take me out to the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and Cracker Jacks. I don't care if I ever get back. We will root, root, root for the home team. If they don't win, it's a shame. For it's one, two, three strikes you're out at the old ball game. There's another stanza after that. We don't know if she ever did go to the ball game with the guy, but uh, Katie knew all the players. She knew them by heart. Women in 1908 were looked down upon if they went to a baseball game. This was not a ladylike thing to do to see a baseball game. Um, but she knew all of them, and she knew how to get them going. Now, how did she get them going? Well, she would root, but then again, if you saw the movie Bull Durham, you might think that she was a baseball Annie as well. Uh, last year, 2019, uh, there was an op-ed piece in the Washington Post which said inadvertently Norwith and Von Tilzer may have written the first women's liberation song because it was looked down upon for a woman to go to a baseball game. That just didn't happen. Baseball players were ruffians. They weren't the kind of guys that um, you would hang out with. One player, uh, Eddie Delante, was thrown off a, a train, allegedly, going through uh, Niagara Falls. Uh, he was a great player, and his death to this day, and you're talking 120 some odd years later, has never been solved. Uh, uh, one pitcher, Rube Waddell, with the Philadelphia A's, had a lover spat, broke up, spring training, 1903. Um, and maybe he tried to commit suicide because he wrestled an alligator. So these kind of guys playing baseball, Ty Cobb as well, back in those days. The song would become famous on the vaudeville stage, and it would become famous because of Nora Bays, uh, Norwood's wife. Uh, she popularized the song along with another song called Shine On Harvest Moon. Um, Von Tilzer would finally see a baseball game 32 years after he wrote the music, uh, rather the words, in 1940. Uh, Norwood would see his first baseball game in 1928. Uh, I want to just uh, touch upon Katie Casey for a moment or two and, and some other things that happened in this era. In this era. Uh, like I said, we don't know much about Katie Casey. It's presumed she's somewhere between the ages of 18 and 23, uh, that she was a young Irish woman uh, living on the Lower East Side of Manhattan or, or maybe in Brooklyn. Uh, and for some reason, she's a baseball fan. Um, that might have been influenced by Norwith um, and his ex-girlfriend. But in 1910, women were not going to baseball games, but they did not have the right to vote. And in 1910, the suffragettes were in Washington and they were uh, at William Howard Taft's office, the president of the United States, screaming about wanting to vote and wanting to vote. 
And uh, Taft was insistent this couldn't happen. And he's getting very depressed sitting with these women hammering at him that they want the vote. So he slips a note to one of his aides and says, see if we could get tickets to today's baseball game, opening day in Washington. And uh, the, uh, the aide comes back, says it's all arranged. Mr. Taft decides he has had enough. He excuses himself. The entourage goes to a baseball game. It is opening day in Washington. And in opening day, somebody gets the idea, why don't we give the baseball to uh, President William Howard Taft to throw out the first pitch. First presidential pitch thrown out by William Howard Taft. Also that day, because he needed his spirits lifted because these women were banging on him for the vote. He couldn't take it. Maybe Katie Casey was one of them. Uh, also that day, uh, seats back in those days were only 19 inches across, not 23 inches across. And William Howard Taft was a big man, weighed well over 300 pounds, once got stuck in the White House bathtub. Uh, so he's going like this, this, and this, this, 19 inch seats, today they're 23 inches, except Fenway Park in Boston, still 19. And uh, in between the top of the seventh and bottom of the seventh inning, he decides he's got to get up. And the crowd's watching him, and they're thinking, oh, the president is leaving, we better stand up. Everybody better stand up and uh, to show the proper respect. But Taft sits down and everybody else sits down. Allegedly, that's the beginning of the seventh inning stretch in baseball, all because of women's suffragettes. Although there are some people who theorize there was a seventh inning stretch in Ohio in the 1890s where Taft was back uh, in those days. Uh, but anyway, well, we know that Taft did throw out the first ball, and we know it's in conjunction with the suffragettes, one of whom might have been Katie Casey. Uh, the song Take Me Out to the Ball Game, well, it has been visited in movies and in TV and certainly in radio. It is still the most popular song from 1908 uh, under normal circumstances, played at various places daily. Uh, between February and November of any given year. Uh, this is uh, Night at the Opera. There is Groucho, who is the manager of the opera company owned by uh, or, or uh, funded by uh, the Margaret Dumont character. They go over to Italy. They're looking for the world's greatest tenor uh, to bring back for the opera. And of course, Groucho runs into Chico and Harpo, and they have a friend who's a tenor. And mayhem ensues, uh, including the steam room, uh, <laughs> uh, the stateroom scene where they all fall out. Um, they have to kill some time because uh, the real tenor, they have to knock off to get the fake tenor in there, uh, played by Alan Jones, Jack Jones's uh, uh, father. And so to kill some time, Harpo and Chico hand out sheet music in the orchestra pit to the museum uh, musicians, it is Take Me Out to the Ball Game, 1936. And Groucho comes down and starts selling peanuts and Cracker Jacks. Uh, the first time uh, the song is played at a major league game is in 1934, during the World Series between St. Louis and Detroit in Detroit. Harpo Marx would return to the song on an episode of I Love Lucy in 1955, playing it on his harp. Uh, it was in numerous movies and numerous TV shows, Take Me Out to the Ball Game. Now, I don't think Abbott and Costello played the Borscht Belt all that much back uh, in their heyday. Uh, as you might know, or may not know, baseball was not... Uh, Baseball was not invented by Abner Doubleday in 1839. Hate to burst your bubble about that one. Uh, the Mills Commission, uh, in the turn of the 19th into 20th century, first couple of years of the uh, 20th century, was looking for a story how baseball started in America. It's America's game, all this other stuff. And they found this, uh, for lack of a better word, drunk. Uh, in Denver by the name of Abner Graves. And uh, they sat down and talked to him and he claimed that he was five years old and he saw Abner Doubleday in Cooperstown laying out a baseball diamond. And that's where baseball started. And that's the story the Mills Commission uh, came up with as to baseball being invented in 1839. Abner Doubleday was at West Point. 
at that time, and there was no record of him ever leaving West Point for uh, Cooperstown, which would have taken him more than a day to get to back in those days and a day back. Baseball, according to a museum in North Adams, Massachusetts, uh, up in the Berkshires, uh, there's a Jack Chesborough Museum. Jack Chesborough won 41 games for the New York Highlanders in 1904, predecessor of the Yankees. Um, and there's this little museum because Chesborough comes from the North Adams area. And there's a little clipping of a newspaper from, say, 1792, where they talk about baseball. Now, if that's true, and I have no reason to believe it's not true, uh, baseball evolved from a game called Rounders played in England. Uh, the comic style of Abbott and Costello uh, for this particular routine and some other routines that they did, but this one in particular is called Rounders. It's an old vaudeville burlesque, B-U-R-L-E-S-Q-U-E. That's for everybody or B-U-R-L-E-S-K. It's where the women take their clothes off. But it's a common style. Uh, what you have is the straight man uh, who is played here by Bud Abbott. And straight men always get 60% of the take. The, the idiot would get 40% because you couldn't find a good straight man. Now, the straight man's a smart aleck. The idiot, uh, the buffoon, Lou Costello in this case, asks a ton of questions. He's got this question, he's got that question. And the straight man, the smart aleck, gives him the answer. Uh, when who gets paid, does he get the check? every penny and it would go on and on. So Abbott and Costello get this routine, 1936, they met on the burlesque circuit a couple of years earlier and uh, they get this routine and it's a routine that was done by a guy by the name of Michael Musto and others. It is thought that Musto came up with the routine in St. Louis and couldn't go anywhere with it. It's like Jerry Lewis, Jerry Lewis borrowed, I'll say borrowed, he was up at, uh, in, in the Catskills from the time he was like 14 to 20. And uh, he used to observe everybody. And uh, he used to take in all of the routines. He just did it better than anybody else. It's just how it is in, in comedy. And uh, I have two comic friends, one guy named John Joseph, whose mentor was Alan King. Remember Alan King uh, on the Ed Sullivan Show, among others? Uh, that was his protege, John Joseph. And John and I were talking one day, and we're talking about this routine because he did an offshoot of it music-wise. And uh, he says, you know, Mike Musto got 15 bucks for it. I said, oh, really? He said, you got 15 bucks. And I talked to my other friend, Max Docelli, who played at Villa Roma just last Friday night. And Max said to me about this, he stole it. They stole it. We're comics. We steal everything. Well, not quite. Max sold five jokes to Rodney Dangerfield. Rodney didn't steal jokes from him. He bought them from uh, Max. Anyway, so it goes round and round and round. There are no answers. It just goes round and round and round and round and, and really would go on in infinity if they had time. Abbott and Costello could do it for a minute. They could do it for 10 minutes. Um, like I said, it was uh, the, a classic routine. Uh, it was uh, a vaudeville common style act of rounders. And the question is, did Mike Musto get the $15? Well, nobody seems to know. And there are other people who claim that they came up with the routine. Was it a baseball burlesque routine? Maybe. Uh, there's been a suggestion that Abbott in the late 1920s, before he met Costello on the burlesque, burlesque circuit, actually did sort of a version of the routine. But uh, they would meet up in the 1930s and they'd have some success and they would end up on the Kate Smith radio show as players. Uh, on the show, and uh, they have this routine, and they are going to unleash it for the baseball season. They may have gotten some help in polishing it up from John Grant, who was Costello's writer, Costello's writer until the 1950s, and uh, there was some Red Channel activity and communist suggestions about John Grant. Costello fired them, fell flat, rehired them, and a guy by the name of Will Glickman. Um, the the act debuts on the Kate Smith show in March of 1938. Evan Costello become superstars after that. They don't need the Kate Smith show anymore. 
They would perform at the White House for Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, and Dwight Eisenhower. They would perform in the movies, the routine, on radio, on TV. I remember the last one, the Abbey Costello show. I used to watch it as uh, reruns on WPIX Channel 11 in New York as a kid. Abbott and Costello are enshrined in Baseball's Hall of Fame. They were the first outsiders uh, ever to get an honor in Baseball's Hall of Fame in the mid-1950s. Now, about 15 years ago, the Los Angeles Dodgers. Uh, Vin Scully, the announcer, who started with the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1950 and moved west with them after the 1957 season. I hope that I'm not offending anybody by saying the Dodgers had moved. Some people said, don't ever mention that to me again, the worst day of my life. Anyway, uh, Vin Scully is looking at his TV screen and he sees this. And in the Vin Scully way, he says, now we know the answer to the eternal question of who's on first. Ladies and gentlemen, there is who. The Dodgers had a player they signed out of the South Korean League by the name of who. Who? is on first. There was a Watt, Watt's on second, who's on first, Watt's on second. There was a Watt who played was second base with Washington in the 1920s. Pretty good player too. Uh, but that was before the routine became famous. Uh, who's on first? Um, there are offshoots of it now. It's not as popular as it once was, say when I was a kid. Uh, but then again, it was 82 years ago that it was unveiled. And uh, there are some school teachers in New Jersey that bring it out for talent shows every year where they have two kids doing who's on first. Uh, a number of years ago, three years ago, my wife and I went up to Hyde Park. In the Hyde Park, it's really nice, President Roosevelt's uh, library. And uh, I had three questions to ask President Roosevelt because I do a talk, uh, actually I do two, two talks. One is called Jews and Sports, and the other is uh, about the 1936 Berlin Olympics, and the Jews and Sports takes a piece out of the Berlin, or yeah, uh, out of the Berlin Olympics. So I wanted to ask Roosevelt why he said the American team should go to Berlin in 1936. I also do a talk called The Early Days of TV, and Roosevelt was the first guy on commercial TV in the United States, April 30th, 1939. Uh, welcoming people to the New York World's Fair. Of course, by that time, he was an old hand uh, with fireside chats and all in, in uh, media. And there was one other thing, the green light letter, which allowed baseball to play after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Kansas City Mountain Landis was the uh, Major League Baseball commissioner, and he sends a letter to Roosevelt. Uh, and he wants to know, what should we do? In 1918, the season was cut short, not by the Spanish flu, uh, but was cut short because of World War I. And uh, the American League voted to stop playing on September 1st. The National League went to go, wanted to continue playing. Compromise was worked out where the Red Sox could play the Chicago Cubs in the 1918 World Series, a uh, uh, World Series that the Red Sox would win behind the left arm of Babe Ruth, who set a, a record for most consecutive shutout innings. So Landis sends uh, a letter to um, FDR, and FDR sends back a letter called the Green Light Letter. I honestly feel that would be best for the country to keep baseball going. Baseball provides a recreation which does not last over two or two and a half hours. Roosevelt died in 1945, so he hasn't seen Red Sox-Yankee games over the past 15, 20 years and which can be got for very little cost. He hasn't sat in the box seats at Yankee Stadium. He, his, he could afford it, most people can't. And incidentally, I hope that night games can be extended because it gives an opportunity to the day shift to see a game occasionally. Uh, Dan Rooney was the president of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, he passed away a few years ago, about 15, 18 years ago. We got to talking about Roosevelt and the green light letter and it was only sent to baseball. But Rooney, whose father Art owned the Pittsburgh Steelers in the National Football League, said with that letter, we took it upon ourselves that we had the green light to play. Also, the National Hockey League had the green light to play, although the National Hockey League was starving for players because World War, I, uh, World War II started in 1939, not 1941. 
for Canada as part of the British Empire at that point. Uh, so they were starving for players, and eventually the New York Americans would fold because there weren't enough players around, and they were supposed to move to Brooklyn. Um, whatever passed for any kind of professional basketball also said yes, uh, golf and tennis uh, as well, and, and horse racing too, uh, all because of the green light letter. That's how powerful baseball was. Baseball was really powerful uh, in the country going into World War II. Baseball in the movies. Baseball in the movies. Uh, Babe Ruth was in 10 movies. The first one was in 1920, Heading Home. Hey, typecasting. Babe was a baseball star. He was uh, in a movie called Babe Comes Home in 1927. That's a silent movie. No print to survive. If you knew how they made prints back in the 19-teens and the 1920s, um, they aren't the prints that are around today. You really had to preserve them as soon as they came out. They didn't bother with that. They did bother to keep a Harold Lloyd silent movie in 1928 called Speedy Around. Babe plays himself, and he's signing autographs for kids. He sees Harold Lloyd, who's a cab driver in New York, uh, and he hails the cab and and Harold Lloyd gives him one of the worst rides you could imagine to Yankee Stadium. In all, Ruth was in 10 movies. The first one heading home, the last pride of the Yankees, the Lou Gehrig story. But the first real star was Mike Donlan. Mike Donlan was a second baseman with the New York Giants who um, spent time playing baseball and then would leave baseball for chunks at the time to perform on stage and in vaudeville. He was known as the baseball idol of Manhattan. Manhattan doesn't have a team. Uh oh, Evan, did we lose you? Donlin, that was a, uh, excuse me. We, I think we lost you for a couple of moments there. Hold on, hold on. Uh, video or audio? Uh, video and audio. Okay. Well, you can, okay, I'm back. How about, can you hear me? There we are. Yes. Okay. Uh, I did talk about Babe Earth, right? You got that? Yes. Okay. We and just Mike, started with Mike Donlin. Mike Donlin. Mike Donlan was a second baseman with the New York Giants. Um, he was the first guy who really got a career going on stage and in vaudeville. He was known as the baseball idol of Manhattan. He retired in 1914, went into the movies. And the first movie he did is called Right Off the Bat, which featured his New York Giants manager, John McGrew, who also dabbled in movies. Uh, he made at least 53 appearances on film. There would be other baseball players who uh, went on to um, TV and in film. Uh, Johnny uh, Berardino is one of them, Wes Parker, another one, and uh, Chuck Connors. We'll talk about Connor uh, in a few minutes. Uh, so he was the baseball idol of Manhattan. Lou Gehrig. Lou Gehrig was in a movie called Rawhide back in 1938. The movie is not very memorable. It's a terrible movie. Uh, he becomes a cowboy. This is a kid who was born in New York City, raised in New York City, went to college in New York City, played his professional baseball career in New York City, lived in New York City until he moved out to the suburbs right around here, uh, Lou Gehrig Way over in New Rochelle. So he was a total New Yorker through and through. This 1938 movie, Rawhide, has Gehrig retiring because he's had enough of baseball. He can't stand the pressure of baseball anymore. He's married at the time, but in the movie, he is retiring and he has bought a ranch in Montana with his sister, not his wife, his sister. And he's gone out to Montana where he could relax and live out his days in solitude. And that's a scene at Grand Central Terminal with him. Now, it's far-fetched, obviously, uh, but... And, and, and it would be a movie that would be forgotten, except for one thing. Lou Gehrig in 1936, or rather 1939, is diagnosed with ALS. And most doctors had no baseline for ALS. This movie, all of a sudden, comes out, and they have a baseline. So they could look at Gehrig, how he was wandering around, how he was walking in 1938, how he was swinging his torso and his neck and all. And they had a baseline to see how quickly ALS would progress. Gehrig, Gehrig's greatness on the baseball field 
was undeniable, but his medical contribution may have been very important, as was Babe Ruth's medical contribution. Babe Ruth was one of the first people to undergo chemotherapy after he got throat cancer, helped him a little bit, and then he died. But so they, they had a baseline of what Gehrig looked like. Uh, the film opens with Gehrig announcing his retirement uh, from baseball. He's at Grand Central uh, Station, and um, he's going out to Montana. He's going to leave New York behind. Cartoons, everything I learned in life, so it seems, I learned from Bugs Bunny and Warner Brothers cartoons. I learned music, I learned some American history, and I learned how to heckle. Bugs Bunny is the greatest animated comic ever. Would have fit in well in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s over at the hotels, and he wouldn't be playing the small hotels. He'd be at, uh, at Grossinger's, he'd be at Concord, Concord, he'd be at Cutcher's. He'd be playing the big places, no small places for Bugs Bunny. Uh, he's in this uh, cartoon where he's a heckler. The guest house gorillas are playing the teetotalers and they're killing the teetotalers and Bugs starts heckling them. I can beat you with one arm tied behind my back. Notice the carrot juice there. Notice the, uh, the popcorn over there and the half-eaten carrot. So he challenges the guest house gorillas. They take him up on his offer and there is a baseball game between Bugs and the Gas House Gorillas, and Bugs would win the baseball game. Casey Candell was the second baseman with the Montreal Expos in the 1990s. Uh, I got to talking to him one day about this, uh, the movie uh, League of Their Own, because Casey Candell's mother had played in this league, which was founded by the chewing gum guy, Phil Wrigley in Chicago. And um, Casey was the technical advisor in this movie that starred Madonna, Rosie O'Donnell, Gina, Gina Davis there with uh, the chest protector, and Tom Hanks is in this movie. He's playing a character based on Jimmy Fox, the great uh, baseball player. He's the manager of the team, and uh, the line is, there's no crying in baseball. Uh, Casey told me he was part of this movie because the family wanted to get this thing right. The mother played in this uh, in in the league, and um, they wanted to make sure that technically they got a lot of things right. Uh, Wrigley got out of the league. The league lasted about nine years, from 1943 to around 1952. League of their own. Uh, there is Gary Cooper playing Lou Gehrig in Pride of the Yankees, written by Paul Gallico. You might have some of Gallico's works in your library. As a matter of fact, he wrote the So Goose stories. And he also wrote the Poseidon Adventure, which would become the basis of the Poseidon Adventure film. Um, Gary Cooper playing Lou Gehrig in Pride of the Yankees, which also was Babe Ruth's last movie. Uh, Bull Durham, Kevin Costner uh, playing Crash Davis and uh, Tim Robbins playing Newton Lelouch. Uh, Ron Shelton wrote this movie, came out around 1988. Shelton was a minor league player with the Baltimore Orioles organization. And uh, he was teammates with a guy by the name of Steve Dalkowski. And Dalkowski was a left-handed pitcher who could throw a ball through a brick window, a brick wall rather, throw a ball through a, a brick wall. Uh, very wild, had a lot of off the field problems, including alcoholism. Um, Costner plays a character who uh, is supposed to be the veteran catcher, not good enough for the major leagues, but too good for the minor leagues. And he's supposed to mentor the uh, pitcher with the 10 cent head and the million dollar arm to make him a major league pitcher. And the subplot in this one is that Costner is living with baseball Annie, Susan Saradin, and Susan likes to break in young players that uh, she thinks are gonna be stars in the major leagues, Bull Durham. Uh, Jerry Lewis. Uh, when O'Malley moved the Dodgers to Brooklyn, the Dodgers became big in film, whether it was uh, movies or TV. Jerry Lewis, The Geisha Boy, which came out in 1959, explaining something to Pee Wee Reese in terms of what he wanted uh, in this movie. Uh, Robert Redford uh, played uh, in The Natural, the uh, book The Natural, which is also in the library, I would imagine. Uh, Costner again, field of uh, rather uh, uh, the uh, I can't I've drawn a blank on the uh, on the movie talking to Joe uh, Field of Dreams. 
talking to Joe Jackson, uh, who was thrown out of baseball in 1920 for allegedly fixing the 1919 World Series. Uh, there is uh, Brad Pitt as Billy Bean, who thinks he's the smartest guy in baseball. The movie Moneyball by Michael Lewis. The book Moneyball, Michael Lewis. And it was Billy Bean's analytical approach to putting together a team with the Oakland A's. Billy Bean was the first round draft pick of the New York Mets in 1980 and never made it. And Walter Matthau, who I know played the Borscht Belt, um, one of the uh, last of the Yiddish theater people. Uh, this was a rare time without uh, Jack Lemmon. He did, uh, he did a whole bunch of movies with Jack Lemmon basically playing the same character, Oscar and Felix, starting with The Fortune Cookie in 1962, The Odd Couple, of course, and uh, the Grumpy Old Men series. And he's in Bad News Bears. And he flips over uh, one of the players, and they were sponsored by Chico Bill Bonds. Major League, Charlie Sheen, that movie, which is 30 years old now, Cleveland wins the World Series. And uh, that brick wall is in Pittsburgh. That was me two years ago in Pittsburgh. Uh, that is all that is left of Forbes Field, that wall, which is uh, located right in the middle of the University of Pennsylvania uh, at Shenley Park. Uh, the wall is still there. Um, and the spot where Bill Mazeroski hit his home run to uh, win the 1960 World Series is marked piece of cement near that wall. And uh, there is a reason I have a picture of that wall. The reason is Bing Crosby was part owner of the Pittsburgh Pirates in 1946, beginning in 1946. Bob Hope, uh, also in 1946, his uh, road to wherever partner, uh, also bought uh, into a baseball team. He bought into the Cleveland Indians uh, baseball team uh, in 1946. Um, the wall is at the University of Pittsburgh, absolutely. Um, anyway, uh, Crosby invests in the Pirates. Same year, Hope invests in the Indians, getting a piece of the team from uh, Bill Vec. Uh, there was a movie that was floating around called Angels in the Outfield, and somebody suggested, hey, Bing owns a piece of the Pittsburgh Pirates. It's a beautiful park, uh, Forbes Field. That was before it, it, it deteriorated. Uh, why don't we go shoot a film in Pittsburgh, which they did. So some of the movies you might know, Pride of the Yankees, Bull Durham, Major League, Angels in the Outfield, Fields of Dreams, The Geisha Boy, Bad News Bears, The Natural, Moneyball, and a whole list of others, which I haven't put on that list. Now, I was in Rockland County. Uh, that's where I started my career uh, in radio in 1971. And I got to WGRC Radio in 1978 and was also working with WNEW Radio in 1978 at the age of 21 as a Northern Suburbs correspondent, because I got a scoop that John Lindsay was running for the Senate out of New York in 1980. And WNEW decided I should uh, do the story for them and they kept me around for three and a half years. Uh, but anyway, net fine. 1979, I found out that this guy by the name of Nat Fine was working for the local utility company, Orange and Rockland. And he was a Pulitzer Prize winner. And I'm trying to figure out, how could a Pulitzer Prize winner work for a utility? Well, the World Journal Tribune had folded, Journal American had folded, and he needed a job. So he got a job taking pictures of squirrels being fried on wires. He shot that in 1948. And I talked to him about that. I was 23 years old. We are just talking. I said, you did that famous picture. Well, that famous picture won a Pulitzer Prize. And I asked him, how'd you get the picture? Because you see other photographers are on the first baseline at Yankee Stadium. And he said, well, they're all taking pictures of the babe in the locker room, putting on the uniform for the last time because everybody knew that babe in 1948 was dying. This is old timers day. And he said, I decided to do something else. And the Yankees clubhouse was on the third base side those days, not the first base side. And the, the uh, dugout was um, on the third base side. And he said, I went to the top of the steps and I saw a babe leaning on the baseball bat. That's the picture. It was the first sports picture ever to win a Pulitzer Prize. 
it is a famous picture. I don't know how famous it is today. It is a very, very famous picture. And the guy ended up shooting uh, uh, pictures of wires with squirrels being fried after doing something like that and all kind of other assignments he had for the Journal American and then the World Journal Tribune. Is Homer Simpson in the Baseball Hall of Fame? Yes or no? I will answer that in a little while. Uh, 1992, The Simpsons. Uh, the uh, Springfield Nuclear Power Plant beat the baseball all-stars to win the local championship. And there is uh, Smithers with the trophy and Monty Burns, the owner of the power plant. Wilbur. Sandy Koufax. I don't know who Sandy is signing an autograph to, whether it's Mr. Ed or Wilbur, uh, Alan po uh, who is played uh, by Alan Post, um, Alan Young, rather. Alan Young, Wilbur Post, Alan Young. Uh, I used to watch that show as a kid, and Sandy and Johnny Roseboro were on the show when Mr. Ed tried out for the Brooklyn Dod uh, Los Angeles Dodgers. This is my favorite, absolute favorite baseball television show. Uh, it is Leo DeRocher signing Herman Munster to a contract with the Los Angeles Dodgers. And the whole premise of the show is really, really silly and stupid. Leo DeRocher, if you knew anything about Leo, the only time he ever woke up in the morning was for a baseball game. And yet here he is strolling through a park near the Munster home. Uh, and there is Herman going out to play baseball with his son, Edward Wolfgang Munster, typical American family, and he's hitting rocket shots, fly balls, which Eddie's tracking down, and Leo comes out of the bushes, and he's got a contract. He's the third base coach of the Dodgers, but he's got a contract all ready to go, and Herman tries out for the Dodgers, but he's seven foot six, weighs 540 pounds, hurts everybody, so the Dodgers release him. A couple months later, Elroy Crazy Legs Hirsch, the uh, general manager of the National Football League's Los Angeles Rams, sees Herman punting to his son, comes up, he's going to give him a contract. At least he was the general manager, he could give him a contract. And Leo comes out of the bushes again, no, 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 don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. My favorite baseball episode in a situation comedy. Um, the guy on the left is Jim Lefevre. The guy on the right is Al Ferrara, who once said uh, he knew he had made it into the major leagues when he had his face on the baseball card. They are on Gilligan's Island. <laughs> the uh, TV loved the Los Angeles Dodgers. I once asked Lefevre about this. What were you doing? He said, we were trying to shrink. Gilligan's head. I said, you know, so many people visited that island. It's amazing to me that um, nobody knew that they were there. So many people, Harlem Globetrotters were on that island too. Johnny Roseboro, this looks like Dragnet, right? Well, it was Dragnet. Johnny Roseboro was on Dragnet. Just the facts, man. The Dodger catcher. Walter O'Malley, the Dodger owner, appeared with the Rifleman star and the one-time Brooklyn Dodgers first baseman in Ch Chuck Connors in the Goodson Todman only primetime television Western branded. That was in 1965. Willie Davis acted in The Love Machine. The Dodgers center fielder. He was also in Jerry Lewis's Which Way to the Front and The Flying Nun. Roseboro, uh, Jack Webb saw something in him. He put him on Dragnet 1968. Burke's Law, Craft Suspense Theater, Mr. Ed, and Experiment in Terror. How many of you know the guy on the left there? You know the guy, how many of you know the guy on the right? You know the guy on the right? If you do, I'll give you, I'll give you 10 seconds. If you do, type it in. Because you probably don't know. And I'm gonna give you the answer in a second. Do, 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 do I have to pay Murph Griffin if I do that? Okay, let me see what, what you come up with. Uh, the guy on the right, yeah, that's Phil Silvers. Uh, but the guy on the right is named Steve Bilko. Steve Bilko is the guy on the right. Steve Bilko is one of these guys. Steve Bilko was one of these guys who was too good for minor league baseball, but not a good enough to play major league baseball. So he played in the Pacific Coast League his, most of his career, although he was with a number of teams uh, in major league baseball. He finished up with the Los Angeles Angels 1968. 61, rather, expansion team. And that Hyken, who 
built, and he, he was the guy who wrote Bilko and built the whole Bilko show around Phil Silvers, uh, was watching a baseball game. And he sees Steve Bilko, and he says, that's it. That's the name I want. I want that name for the character Phil Silvers was playing. Ernest Bilko, who built everybody. He was a con man uh, at Fort Baxter in uh, Kansas. Steve Bilko. Uh, never got any money for it, but he was, uh, that, that was Ernie Bilko. That's who he's named after. So some of the shows, Donna Reed Show, Brady Bunch, Mr. Ed, The Munsters, Phil Silver Show, also known as Bilko, which means it's time to talk about Yogi because Yogi was omnipresent in the 1950s. And he's on the Bilko show. And one day I'm sitting around in that back room with Yogi and we're just talking about stuff. I said, you were on the Bilko show. I said, yeah. I said, yeah, because I saw it. And you were on with a bunch of Yankees, including I think Hank Bauer was on. And he said, let me ask you a question. I said, where were the Yankees? Why were the Yankee players in the middle of Kansas at this fort? No, we did it in the Bronx. Yeah, I know you did it in the Bronx. I know you did it in the Bronx. No, we I left my house. We went across the George Washington Bridge, two exits into the Cross Bronx Expressway. I got off and I drove to the studio. We got to the studio. Uh, we walked in and then we walked out. That was it. And at that point, I decided, you know what? Yogi's right. It was done in the Bronx. <laughs> Aaron Spelling, the king of schlock on TV. I mean, every schlock show you could imagine. Uh, Charlie's Angels. Um, the Pain, The Pain uh, with, uh, with Ricardo Bonobon, uh, Fantasy Island. Um, the other one, Love Boat. Uh, and then Dynasty as well, and a whole bunch of others. He used to take the baseball encyclopedia, and that would be names of minor league players and major league players. He would look for names of television characters looking through the baseball encyclopedia, and he came up with Moose Steubing of the Love Boat, uh, or Captain Steubing for the Love Boat from Moose Steubing, uh, who was a longtime minor league player who eventually managed uh, the Anaheim Angels in Major League Baseball. Uh, the voice in Charlie's Angels that you never saw the face was John Forsythe. John Forsythe landed his first paying job after college as the ballpark PA announcer for the Dodgers in Ebbets Field in, 19, in the 1950s. Uh, he would later star in one of Spelling's hits, Dynasty, in the 1980s. And it, uh, there is Moose Steubing from the Bronx, moved to El Paso, Texas. I said to him one day, I said, Moose, I got a question for you. He said, What's that? I said, Do you ever get paid from? Uh, Aaron Spelling, he said, nope, never got paid. But I know it's me. Moose Steubing, the inspiration for the Gavin McLeod character on the Love Boat, Captain Steubing. And what goes around comes around. John Forsythe from up in the stands, unseen to the baseball field at Dodger Stadium, the Hollywood All-Star, standing next to Jack Lemmon. Now, if you remember the movie, The Odd Couple with Jack Lemmon and Walter Matthau, you might remember a scene where Jack decides to call the press box at Shea Stadium because he wants to know what Oscar wants for dinner. Well, uh, Bill Mazeroski was at the plate. Oscar turns his back to the field to talk to Felix about dinner, and Bill Mazeroski grounds into a triple play which causes all kind of havoc within the movie because Oscar missed the triple play, a great play for his team. He's fans of the New York Mets. So there's Jack Lemon who ruined Oscar Madison's day at Shea Stadium when Bill Mazeroski hit into a triple play and John Forsythe finally on the field with the Dodgers. I've known Bob Uecker for about 35 years and uh, Milwaukee Braves, Milwaukee Brewers baseball announcer, but played with the Milwaukee Braves, Atlanta Braves, St. Louis Cardinals, and Philadelphia Phillies. Mr. Baseball, according to Johnny Carson. So Johnny Carson wasn't a baseball fan, had no idea who Bob Uecker was. Bob Uecker was a pretty obscure player who, for some reason, used to hit Sandy Koufax like he was Henry Aaron. Uh, he, he is finally out of baseball. He lands a job working community relations for the Atlanta Braves. And he's going around the South as a stand-up comic. And he's working a club 
in Atlanta, and Al Hurt, the trumpet player, sees him. And Hurt had been on the Tonight Show a lot. Calls up Carson. He says, you got to get this guy on. Got to get this guy on. He says, who is he? He's Bob Euchre. Now, uh, I'm on cruise ships, so I know a lot of comics like Wayne Cotter, uh, who would tell me, if you got on the Carson show, uh, and if you uh, were good, he invited you to the couch. And obviously, you was invited to the couch. And uh, uh, he, uh, Carson, during the break, Carson, during the break, says to you, is it true you played baseball? And you said, well, I have one of these, so baseball cards. So, yeah, I did. Euchre had a pretty good TV career. He was on Johnny Carson a lot, an awful lot. Uh, he also was in the uh, Mr. Belvedere show from about 1984 to 1990, where he played a uh, sports writer on that show, which uh, starred Donna Deverona's sister, Joanne Kearns, as his wife. Donna Deverona won two gold medals in the Tokyo Olympics. Friend of mine, dropping the names. Uh, but anyway, so that was Bob Euchre. And of course, Euchre, they must have put me in the front row in the Miller Lite commercials. Broadway, Broadway, whatever Lola wants, Lola gets. Damn Yankees, 1954, uh, 55. Uh, Washington hasn't won. Their drought wasn't that long at that point. It was about two decades. And Joe Hardy decides he's going to sell his soul to the devil so Washington can win. Uh, two songs in that um, show that are still around today that people remember. Whatever Lola wants, Lola gets. And the other, you gotta have heart. Sung by the Mets on the Ed Sullivan Show in 1969 after they won the World Series. Now, you don't know this, but Jerry Stiller is my cousin, which is a perfect segue of what I'm doing. And uh, Stiller and Mirror were on uh, the show about 36 times, and Jerry and I used to talk about Ed. And basically what you saw with Ed was an old sports writer who happened to be the ring announcer for the Golden Gloves boxing tournament at Madison Square Garden in this corner here, in that corner here. Let's hear it for this one. And Ed seems to be rather happy uh, hosting the New York Mets in 1969. Tom Seaver is in the second row uh, at the right at the end. Uh, to his right three over is Tug McGraw, one of my favorite people. Tug used to name his pitches, like his curveball was known as the Bo Derrick, because it had a little town. And his fastball was uh, also called uh, the Peggy Lee for the song, Is That All There Is? Is That All There Is? Uh, Art Shamsky is still around. I see him occasionally in New York. Next to Art, who's wearing the double-breasted six-button suit, is one of my favorite people, Ron Swoboda, uh, who in 1969, in a game against the St. Louis Cardinals, struck out five times. Also a game in 1969 with the Mets. Uh, the Mets beat the Cardinals and Steve Carlton to the one. Ron Swoboda hit two home runs in that game. And he said to me, how come you remember the five strikeouts and not the two home runs? I said, because I had the, the, this is real typical 50s, 60s kid, 60s kid, baseball and the culture. I had the transistor radio under the bed. And I didn't hear all that well. Anyway, so that's Ed. And uh, it's the perfect segue into this because my cousin Jerry Stiller happened to play the role of Frank Costanza on this show, Seinfeld. I don't know how many of you are Seinfeld addicts. I could take it or leave it at this point. It was a well-written show by Larry David. Now, George Steinbrenner had some brushes with TV. Uh, Saturday Night Live, uh, he hosted Saturday Night Live once, and they did a, uh, a spoof of Steinbrenner playing every position in on the field and also being a coach, a manager, general manager, and the owner. And it wasn't that far from it. Um, George was the TV producer. He was the PR guy. He was the owner. He tried to be the manager. He, you know, he brought in Hopalong Cassidy uh, to, as, a, as a running coach just because he wanted to talk to Hop. Um, you know, I, I got to know George because I covered the Yankees in the 1980s and 1990s. And I got plenty of stories from, from those days because those guys love to tell stories. George Steinbrenner. Now, I got a question for you, and uh, this is a yes or no question. I and mean, it's not a yes or no question. It is, 
Do you think that George actually wrote scripts for Seinfeld? Yes or no? If somebody wants to put it in there, I'll answer that. Do you think he wrote some of the scripts? Yes or no? Give you five more seconds. Okay, I will give you the answer. The word is he didn't write scripts. He came up with script suggestions, send them into Larry David, who put them into television. Here are three storylines that were suggested by George. Missing George, which uh, involves uh, Frank Costanza, my cousin Jerry. Board meeting moved in different uniforms. It's, uh, those are the three that were suggested uh, by uh, George himself. Uh, Missing George. Missing George was based on a guy who worked an American ship in Tampa. Uh, George thought, he was a good worker, but George thought he was hanging around with the wrong type of guys. And um, George was concerned about his friends. And one Friday afternoon, uh, George leaves the place early and goes wherever he's going. And uh, he comes back on Monday morning. He used to get there at six o'clock in the morning and the guy's car is there. And he goes into the building and the guy's not there. And George starts thinking, oh, something happened to him. Something happened. I know something happened to him. Something happened to him. So George calls the Tampa Police Department and they put out an all points bulletin looking for this employee who shuffles into work later on in the day. And George says, what happened? He said, I went away for the weekend with my friends. I left my car here. They picked me up and all that. That story ended up as a Seinfeld episode. And the best part of that Seinfeld episode was my cousin, Jerry Storr, as Frank Costanza. And George uh, walks to his door uh, and uh, he walks through his door and uh, the voice is done by Larry David. He only saw George from the back and they, and he knocks on the door, Mr. Costanza, Mr. Costanza, we think George is dead. And uh, Frank Costanza looks at him and he says, you traded Jay Buner for Ken Phelps? Buner had a pretty good career with Seattle. Phelps was a washout with the Yankees. Uh, the board meeting moved. Uh, the, the, the board meeting moved. And uh, that was uh, very, very simple, the board meeting moved. Uh, if you know that, uh, anything about George, his food was your food, your food was his food. He had no problems pulling a French fry off your plate, no problems pulling a potato chip, no problem. He had no problems doing that at all. And um, there's a board meeting and it's at Yankee Stadium, and I forgot if it was Dave Zen or Rick Cerrone or uh, Joe Safety or any of the PR guys that Joe had uh, that George hired in those days, maybe Harvey Green, who once served house arrest after the uh, Mets beat the Yankees in a spring training game in St. Petersburg before George's friend. Harvey had to, was arrested and was sent to his room and told not to come out except to eat. Uh, as punishment for the team. Uh, anyway, um, one of them said they were having this board meeting and somebody brought in some food and George said, what do I see? And, and they said, you know, this is my food and they moved the whole board meeting. Different uniforms, that was tried in Tampa. They tried a different, uh, different uh, material for the uniforms uh, for the Tampa Yankees in uh, the minor leagues, uh, Florida State League. That, is George Steinbrenner. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. I appreciate that. That is George Steinbrenner. And George Steinbrenner actually appears or tried to appear on the Seinfeld show. The problem was he was terrible. He forgot he was George Steinbrenner and thought he was some sort of actor, which wasn't a good thing. And so the scene doesn't work with Elaine and they have to cut it. And uh, Seinfeld himself uh, talked about it one day. He actually did a scene in the show and it was terrible. We couldn't use it. We cut him out. He wasn't funny. Don't remember exactly what went wrong with it, but it was an awkward situation. Uh, a couple of years ago, I did this uh, talk out uh, in Beth Page and there was a Mets fan there. And he said, how about the Mets? Now, I didn't put the slide in there, but they told the story here. He said, the Mets have to do something. They have to be on TV. And I said, they were. Ed Sullivan says, no, something else. And they were. Keith Hernandez long retired by this point, 
and Roger McDowell were on the Seinfeld show where they reenacted the Kennedy assassination with a spitball. Anyway, this particular show, uh, George Costanza is jealous of Keith because he thinks he's losing Jerry's affection, uh, that uh, Jerry's best friend is going to become Keith. Now, Keith and Jerry are friends now. Hernandez said uh, when his agent, Scott Boris, who's still around, this is over 20 years ago, uh, asked him if he wanted to be on Seinfeld. And he replied, what's that? Scott said, oh, the fly out first class. You'll be in the nice hotel for a week. And oh, they give you 15 grand. Keith decided, oh yeah, I know all about him. Let's go, 15 grand help. Uh, I was gonna take this out of this presentation, except I watched the opening episode of Jeopardy's 37th season about a month ago, uh, season 37, episode one, where Alex asked the question, uh, asked about Wally Pitt. You know, uh, he replaced Wally Pitt as the Yankee first baseman in 1925. So I figured, yeah, you know what? I don't need this anymore. It's 95 years. Because who says Wally Pitt, have you been out Wally Pitt anymore? But I decided to keep it in there, uh, simply because Alex called out the question, which was in demo jeopardy. Uh, Wally Pip, the myth, lost his job to Luke Gehrig on June 2nd, 1925, because of a headache. Have you been Wally Pipped? Of course, there is a moral to the story. Don't call in sick, because someone else will do your job, and they may do it better, and you'll never get back your job. Um, yeah, Pip might have had a headache, because he was beamed a few days earlier and might have had a concussion, but the Yankees were ready to uh, move on Wally Pip anyway and bring in Lou Gehrig while he would finish up with Detroit and the Newark Bears in the minor leagues uh, for years and years and years. It, it, was, uh, it was the punchline to a joke, Wally Pip. Um, cigarettes and baseball, Babe Ruth would die of throat cancer. Presenting Babe Ruth in a blindfold cigarette test, smoother and better. If you take a look at the Babe, you would think that he's sitting on old Sparky and Sing Sing, ready to be electrocuted with that thing around his eyes. Now the cough and the car load, old gold's mildness and smoothness marked it right off the bat as the best Babe Ruth. And Babe Ruth did have chemotherapy before he died. It worked a little bit on him and then he slid away, uh, but it was deemed successful to use on other people. Uh, always by Chesterfield, the baseball man's cigarette, Bucky Harris and Bob Elliott, Ted Williams, Stan Musial. Someone looks like they knocked out a tooth to put that in the Musial's mouth. Joe D, guarantee you Joe D didn't pay for that. Yule Blackwell, uh, the Cincinnati Reds pitcher, are uh, selling Chesterfields. Now, I knew Joe Garagiola as well. Joe used to tell me when Yogi stepped in it, cleaning it up. He stepped in it. Made a lot of money by stepping in it. Yoo-hoo. Oh, I couldn't stand Yoo-hoo. Yoo-hoo was chocolate water. That's all it was. But it was a big deal. Yogi, <laughs> Yogi certainly drank it. Mickey probably drank it with some Cuddy Sark. Moose Scourin, one of my favorite people. Quick Moose Scourin story. Um, he was nicknamed Moose for obvious reasons. Um, he didn't move very well. He was a shortstop and Casey Stengel, the Yankee manager, liked his bat and said, Moose, if you're going to make it to the major leagues, you got to go to Arthur Murray's dance school and learn how to dance. And Moose told me it was the greatest thing that happened to him. He said, look at me. My name is Moose. Look at me. He said, yeah, I learned how to dance. I was the most popular guy on the dance floor. And I met my wife there. Moose Scourin, this is 1964. He's with Washington and Elston Howard. Now, when Garish Yola said Yogi stepped in it, and Joe had known Yogi since they were both two years old, 1927, they grew up together at Dago Hill, not being politically incorrect, because that's what Yogi and Joe used to call it. It's now called The Hill uh, there. Um, and, uh, oh, we're going to end the program shortly. Ah, that's too bad, because we're going to be missing some stories. Um, Okay, we got 13 minutes. I could get, I could do these stories in 13 minutes. Anyway, um, Yogi uh, is at a country club in 1955. The brand is having trouble getting distributed. Yogi is offered the drink. The Alvarez, the family that founded uh, Yuhu, asked his opinion. Yogi said, I'm on board. And he was. He made a lot of money on that. Um, 
Yogi, this is told to me by Dave Kaplan, who uh, you probably have his books in that library, the Yogi books written by Dave. One time I was in the office and the phone rang and no one else was around. I always answer a ringing phone, so I did. The woman who was calling asked if you who was hyphenated. I said, no man, it's not even carbonated. And Yogi selling Italian dressing, Yogi selling batteries, Yogi selling beer, and Yogi selling a bicycle. Joe DiMaggio, of course, was Yogi's teammate. Uh, Yogi once told me that he went out with Joe and Marilyn. I said, what was the conversation like? He said, I forgot. I don't remember. <laughs> uh, Joe and Marilyn at the Stork Club in New York and guaranteed Joe didn't pay for anything. Uh, the famous romance, uh, January 14th, 1954, they elope in San Francisco. October 54, Marilyn Monroe files for divorce, citing only mental cruelty. And it takes place because of this, the scene from the seven year itch. DiMaggio is on the set that day. This is Stanford, Connecticut in 2017. Marilyn's derriere is facing the first congregational church. So if you walked out, the first thing you saw was uh, her derriere. And uh, on this side, the uh, my left and Marilyn's left is another church. So you saw her altar. Uh, churchgoers were not amused at the first congressional church. Uh, apparently something happened that night uh, at the DiMaggio Monroe household. Now, Joe had four requirements uh, for his wife. One was that she was a stay-at-home wife. Two, she had dinner at five. Three, she didn't make more money than he did. And four, she wasn't more famous than he was. Failed on all accounts. Songs of Baseball, Mrs. Robinson, which started out as Mrs. Roosevelt. We didn't start the fire, Joe and Joe. Did you see Jackie hit the ball? Joe's in the first three songs. Jackie, of course, Jackie Robinson and Mickey by Teresa Brewer. Let's talk about Mrs. Robinson, a song that you have heard 15,000 times or more in your life. And the meeting between Joe DiMaggio and Paul Simon for dinner. Johnny Blanchard told me this story. And uh, it's a quick story. DiMaggio walks in and he looks at Paul Simon. Hello, Paul. How are you? What do you mean? Where have I gone? Joe DiMaggio. I'm here. I'm with you. I did a commercial last week. I haven't gotten anywhere. Paul tries to explain, well, you're an American hero. I was looking for American heroes. And, you know, you left when I was 10 years old. Your last year, I was 10. I never saw you again. So I didn't know what what happened to you? And he's trying to have this literate conversation with Joe who didn't have much to say. And um, eventually Joe would say, okay, all right, fine, whatever. And, uh, Art, and Paul picked up the tab and the song was a great hit. This is what Paul said on the Dick Cavett Show. I said that I didn't mean the lines literally, that I thought of him as an American hero and that genuine heroes were in short supply. He accepted the explanation and thanked me. We shook our hands and said good night. Dick Cavett then asked why Mickey Mantle wasn't, wasn't used. Why DiMaggio? Mantle and DiMaggio hated one another, by the way. And uh, Simon said, it's all about syllables, Dick. It's about how many beats there are. When Mantle asked Paul Simon why they used him instead of me, he said, Mickey Mantle did not sound as good as Joe DiMaggio in the song. It's about how many beats there are. That is uh, Terry Cashman. I share a periodontist with Terry in Riverdale. Terry, baseball's balladeer, working on uh, Jim Croce anthology as we speak to get out as soon as he can. Here's Jim Croce's uh, producer. Uh, he wrote a song called Willie, Mickey, and the Duke, talking baseball. Terry Cashman, if you look at that picture sleeve, something is missing. The something that's missing Joe DiMaggio, airbrushed out of the picture. 1981 song written and performed by Terry, who pitched in the minor leagues for two years, and he wrote a whole bunch of other baseball songs as well in the 1980s. And Phil Rizzuto, he has a gold record, and he has uh, a plaque in Baseball Hall of Fame. I knew Meatloaf, and we talked about uh, Phil one day, and Phil forgot to be Phil. It took 100 takes to do Paradise by the Dashboard Light, for which he got a gold record. Uh, the Rosillo's assignment was simple. Talk about a player who was aggressive base runner, a metaphor for a guy and a girl getting together in the car, gets called out a few times nearly. Eventually, he tries for home on the suicide squeeze. He made it. 
Scooter said he never knew the song was about sex until his kids, in the late 1970s, they were going to college in Boston, told him, it was about sex, Dad. At Huckleberry, he fooled me. Didn't get back the gold record. Baseball cards. Baseball cards. Invented by Cy Berger. Five cards, five cents. Stick of bubble gum. Periodontists, oral surgeons, and dentists. Thank you, Cy, because you made them a lot of money. It was like biting into a desktop uh, sometimes with uh, the gum. Uh, with the baseball card, you keep... Teach yourself how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Uh, it was also your entree into gambling. Gambling. Flipping and all, trading cards, flipping cards. I bet you you didn't know that this was the first thing that you ever gambled in your life if you were a baseball card collector. Also, geography. If you want to know where a player was, Cleveland, you can look it up on the map, see where Cleveland was. And they made great bicycle flaps. You put that uh, clothespin in, you put that card in, and you got that whirling sound. Great bicycle flaps. Unfortunately, kids do not think very highly of baseball cards today. For a lot of us, eight, nine, and 10 year olds, that was our lives. Unfortunately, baseball, not too many new songs, not too much new literature. Yogi story time again, Ernest Hemingway uh, is uh, brought down to the Yankee clubhouse. And he meets with all of the Yankees, Ernest Hemingway, Mickey Mantle, Mickey Mantle, Ernest Hemingway, they shake hands. Ernest Hemingway, Yogi Berra, Yogi Berra, Ernest Hemingway. Uh, hey, Ernie, what paper you write for? Kansas City Star. You don't see too many new movies that you know, have gotten to, you know, Moneyball is the last new movie that was classical. It's just another sport. Homer Simpson is in Baseball's Hall of Fame because of that cartoon. Uh, with Casey at the Bat, the song by John Fogarty, Center Field, that came out in 1985, the Casey Candel uh, technical advisor movie, League of Their Own, and of course, Abby Costello, who was on first. Uh, that is me in 1988, my buddy Bruce Morton to his left from ABC. Bruce and I still talk after 32 years. Uh, talking to Joe Namath, and Joe Namath solidified football's grip on the American public by leading the New York Jets to a Super Bowl win January 12, 1969. Uh, in the 1950s or 1950, baseball, horse racing, boxing dominated American sports. By 1965, football was number one. That guy there, Muhammad Ali, when he left, boxing wasn't the same. And it's slid ever since then. Horse racing, well, a lot of horse racing depends on casinos uh, and casino revenue to keep horse racing going. That is me and Jim Bouton. Uh, that was uh, a number of years ago at Yogi Berra's museum. And uh, Jim and I were friendly. And uh, you probably have uh, the um, book all four in the library, uh, which was humanized baseball players uh, and a very funny book as well. Jim passed away last year. He was living in Great Barrington, Illinois, Human or Great Barrington, Massachusetts, humanized players, one of the most influential books of the 20th century, according to the New York Public Library and maybe your library as well. Um, also, soccer. That's me on the red carpet in Philadelphia for a movie called Sons of Ben in 2015. Uh, I was part of that movie, a documentary. Now, it ain't over until it's over, and it ain't over yet, but it's almost over. And so we got to talk a little bit about Yogi, because Yogi, nobody goes to that restaurant anymore because it's too crowded. Um, Carmen, his wife Carmen, said to Yogi, uh, hey, Tim wants to go see Dr. Shivago. Well, what's wrong with him now? If you take, if you see a fork in the road, take it, and so many others. And the one that his most famous one is, it ain't over till it's over. Now, you may be expecting a great, great story. I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. It ain't a great story. Mike Dyer, who now lives in Sarasota, Florida, uh, who wrote for a long time for the Middletown, Town, uh, Middletown Times Herald, that's what it's called, which you could get, I guess, up in your neck of the woods. Uh, Mike Dyer was writing for the Long Island Post. He was a sports writer. It's 1973. 
Yogi's team is hanging in there. Lots of injuries. Nobody's running away with the National League East pennant race. But uh, mathematically, it's getting a little tight for the Mets. Uh, they can't afford to lose too many more games. And they're getting their injured players back. But they do lose a game. And Mike Dyer is uh, around the scrum, around Yogi's desk. And he says to Yogi, well, Yogi, you're running out of time. Is it over yet? And Yogi said, it ain't over till it's over. That's the last picture I took with Yogi. That is January, uh, June 26, 2011 with Brian Cashman, the New York Yankees general manager. We were uh, at uh, the Yogi Berra Museum uh, in Learning Center. It was a day-long uh, seminar that we were talking about things. I was talking about uh, the politics of sports business. Brian was talking about breaking into baseball, and Yogi was there the last time Yogi patted me on the back uh, in 2011. It ain't over until it's over. Unfortunately, everybody's got to go. Thank you so much, Jonathan, uh, for inviting me. Thank you, everybody else. Uh, we do have time, I guess, for a couple of questions. And um, feel free. Go ahead if you have any or comments. Got to unmute the microphones. Yep. Uh, bear with me one moment. All right, everyone, you can unmute yourself if you have a question. Or a comment. Or comment, whatever you have. None, none, none. Somebody's gotta have something to say. You're all baseball fans, right? Who's gonna win tonight? Dodgers. Dodgers, the Dodgers are gonna win. Dodgers could be a sore subject to some people. Yeah. Anyway. Um, if, oh, wait, wait, we got something here. Uh, the Art of Fielding by Chad Harbeck. Still can't unmute. Lynn can't unmute. I'm sending you something, Lynn. If you want to un unmute. It worked. There you are. Oh, okay. Evan, was there a, um, a particular baseball player that, um, uh, was your favorite or a particular team, you know, no, uh, not or, really. or one that I mean, was not your favorite? No, not really. Once I got into the business, it's just work. Um, I just watched baseball as a kid, but I was out playing baseball. You know, you're out there, you're playing, so you're not really watching all that much. I love baseball cards. My favorite player, uh, uh, Keith Comstock, uh, an obscure mm -hmm. player uh, in the 1980s and 90s, simply because uh, I knew him. And he got traded for two dozen baseballs. <laughs> and, and not only did he suffer the indignity of getting traded for two dozen baseballs, he got the baseballs and had to give them to his old manager. That is quite the indignity. Yeah, uh, he was. Yeah, I forgot what minor league team he was with, but Keith used to tell me really good, funny stories. There were people who would tell me really good, funny stories uh, over the years, and. Hanging around the Yankees in the 1980s and 1990s was an eye-opening experience just hearing the stories. Um, Mickey, uh, I didn't particularly like Mickey, but I found out that uh, Mickey was adored by everybody in Major League Baseball. And, and from the politics of sports side, it was Mickey who put his arm around Marvin Miller in 1968. And... Um, Marvin wasn't sure where Mickey landed as far as the Players Association that Marvin was putting together because Mickey's uh, father and relatives were beaten up in the mines in Oklahoma for unionizing. And uh, so Marvin didn't know how the Players Association was going to go. And Mickey put his arm around uh, um, Marvin down at the Sheridan uh, in Manhattan and said, partner, whatever you want, you got from me. And um, Mickey was universally loved. Uh, my favorite players were to talk to were people like uh, Johnny Blanchard, uh, Roger Maris, um, uh, Ron Svoboda, um, and Tug McGraw. They were characters. I love characters. One of the problems baseball has today, they don't have characters. Those characters. The characters are gone. I mean, Jimmy Pearsall, I mean, Pearsall had paper. He showed me he had papers. 
he was certifiable. <laughs> um, you know, and that's another book that was probably, that's probably in your library. I mean, I, you know, I'm talking to him one day and he takes out these papers and he, he says, look, see, I'm certifiable. <laughs> and he was. Uh, fear strikes out. So, you know, so anyway. Well, and anybody else? Because I want to get you out so you can watch the baseball games as well. Uh, Jonathan, thank you and the library again for inviting me. Uh, I hope everybody- This was terrific. Here. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Lynn. Thank you. And uh, my name is Evan Winger. And uh, maybe with Zoom, we'll see you again. Uh, I do a Super Bowl story too. Uh, and the Super Bowl story is not about the Super Bowl. It's about how the Super Bowl was formed, Act of Congress, and that gets into Namath, and that gets into why there are parties and how it is to this day a political powerhouse as well. So anyway, so thank you so much. And uh, we'll hopefully see you down. Thank you, Barbara. And hopefully we will see you uh, down the line at some point. Thanks, Evan. Okay, enjoy. Have a good night. Thank you. Take care. Okay, Thanks, bye -bye. Jonathan. Thank you. And Jonathan, uh, you got a copy, right? Of yes, the video? sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. So we'll see you and speak to you again, hopefully. Sounds good. Take okay. care. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.